Welcome to Rio Reacts. We dropped the first episode a little while ago while I was on holiday. As you can see, the tan is just glowing. Beautiful. Um, but I want to welcome our, our first guest we've got on here, the one, the only, the Athletics, Mr. David Ornstein. Let's, let's start. And the only place to start is Chelsea, getting that all in check. Crazy place. What is going on down there? Are, are they gaming the system? I always say never sleep on Chelsea because there's so much going on there. It seems 24 hours a day there are things developing. And so it's it's good for a journalist to be across it because there's always news to report. Uh, people will say they're gaming the system, they're exploiting loopholes. But I would just point out that they're working within the system. It's kind of not their fault that uh, these things are possible. So, I don't know, selling um, young players from your academy, homegrown players. In a hotel. At, total profit. Well, selling assets such as the hotels or there's been talk of the women's team as well. If these things are allowed within the regulations and they're capitalising on them, uh, maybe some other clubs have in different ways in the past, maybe uh, some clubs will do so in the future, then you can't exactly blame Chelsea for doing it. You might not like it, but maybe it's up to the Premier League and the clubs as a collective who vote for these changes um, and the rules to do something about it if if they're not happy with it. And so, as far as we know, Chelsea are compliant with profitability and sustainability, PSR, financial fair play. People might think that's ludicrous, but it kind of does make sense when you see how they've balanced the books. They need to publish their accounts. And to date, they have not breached. It feels crazy. There's a lot of spending. There's a lot of signings. There's a lot of sales. There's controversy. There's crazy situations like Conor Gallagher. That's what I wanted to talk about more than mm. anything, because I'm looking at it from a player's perspective. And morally, it just doesn't feel right. Ethically, what message is this sending to the academies, uh, academy players that are coming through? What, is, what, what does this mean? Like, I mean, could you give us a bit of a run through as to, to how this is unfolding with Conor Gallagher, please. Yeah, it's not an ideal situation, but there are multiple sides to all these stories. So Conor Gallagher is approaching, actually, he's into the last 12 months of his contract now in a not too dissimilar situation to Mason Mount. Chelsea haven't managed to agree a new deal with him, haven't wanted to. We don't know exactly because we're not in that room. Has Conor Gallagher wanted to sign a new contract? Clearly, they couldn't agree on the length because there was an offer um, of two years with an option of a third uh, he clearly didn't think that was suitable. Uh, whether Not when your was... teammates are getting six-year deals and eight-year deals and you're getting off a two with an option of one. Yeah, the way Chelsea have explained it is that it was clear at the time that this was being discussed that initially when, so we're talking the summer of 2023, that he wasn't clear to be a regular starter in the team. And so Chelsea would say it was as much for him that they propose this as an interim solution rather than tying him down to a six, seven, eight year deal. So again, they've asked him if he would like to sign this two plus one as an interim measure and, and he's declined to do so. And therefore Chelsea have looked at it and said, well, we'd rather sell him than lose him for free in the summer of 2025. And given he's not a part of their plans, their um, intention was that you'll have to train away from the first team squad who are part of our plans and then the Atletico Madrid deal was agreed. He went over there. He did his medical. It seemed like it was about to be signed. But when the Samu Omarodian transfer to Chelsea in the opposite direction collapsed, it seems there's been an issue with Atletico Madrid's decision. Do they want to go ahead with it? Have they got the finances to go ahead with it? So Conor Gallagher has returned on a plane to Chelsea. He'll go through medical tests. He, he won't be part of the first team training ahead of the Man City game on Sunday. And you feel sorry for him. It's just not a nice situation across the board. I was going to ask you, actually, Rio, like, what would you be thinking as a player in that situation? Have you ever experienced something like this where a really prominent first team member, certainly as of last season, a popular um, player with the fans, is training with the under-21s? The development squad is not part of the plans, despite many people thinking he should be? No, I don't remember that, that happening where a player went and trained with the 21s, but... I just put myself in his position and mm. think, how would I be feeling? But also the, the the players within that squad, they're looking at a homegrown player, lived and breathed Chelsea since he was probably about seven, eight years old, played there, came through the ranks, became captain. And I think he had the most appearances last season. Right, I, I saw a huge kind of 
big painting thing, but they've you know the flags they put up in the stadiums, a massive mm-hmm. one that kind of goes over yeah. the murals of him last end of the season, like. Uh, and then this happens, and then he gets put in the bomb squad. It uh, Chalaba the same, two homegrown players, and the rules seem to uh, now dictate that the clubs feel right. We've got to get rid of some homegrown talent by any means necessary. And and morals and ethics just go out the window. It seems like, well, how about you treat him in a, in a, in a, a respectful way and in a respectful manner? He's going out to Atletico. I know Atletico are playing their part in this, but Chelsea should be looking after these kids because there's a message that goes back to the academy players that are coming through now that will make them think, right, when it comes to my time, it's going to be pure business because Chelsea now the hierarchy are treating this purely business with zero emotion, and it seems like almost now with these FFP rules that Mm -hmm. gone are the days where emotion and actually loyalty to a football club are going to be gone. Yeah. I don't think the uh, rules are designed that you sell homegrown players for profit. It's a byproduct of what the rules are. It's an accounting Mm -hmm. thing because they are in the books as zero because they're produced by the club. Whereas signings who come in with the transfer fee have that transfer fee spread across the length of the contract in an accounting Mm -hmm. mechanism called amortization. So it's an unintended consequence. But now, yeah, if you look at it, it kind of incentivizes clubs to sell those um, zero accounting players, which are the homegrown ones. So it feels a bit dirty. It's like they're pawns in a game here like they're pieces on a chessboard and and many clubs are unhappy with this you've heard that, that, Dave, that, do you, do you not, Dave, Newcastle as do, well. do you not uh, Newcastle and Aston Villa do uh, have done some of this as well but do you not think that the authorities the Premier League and Football Association when they're setting these rules in place they should mm-hmm. think about the permutations the 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 gray areas also that the, the negativity that, that might come with this, what would the reaction be from the football clubs? When you're putting rules in place, you've surely got to think about all the eventualities. And this would have yeah. been one that would have came up straight away, surely. Well, it didn't seem to be much of an issue until recent times because maybe clubs were trading more effectively, had their finances in order. But as the squeeze has come on, on FFP and PSR and the clubs have seen that, the Premier League, the authorities are clamping down. They are serious that the rules have teeth because Everton and Nottingham Forest and Leicester City and maybe Manchester City are all in the process of being punished. Um, then suddenly it was like, we've got to take this seriously and how can we maximise our profits? That's why this June 30th accounting cutoff has become like a transfer deadline day. And we saw that mm. uh, just earlier this summer. Uh, the, the only thing I would say is that um, you know, there are clubs who do have their houses in order and are not looking at these sales. They are doing their transfer business in a way that has not seen homegrown players had to be pushed out. And, you know, I remember seeing with Newcastle and Elliot Anderson before that cut off and Everton have had some as well. So, you know, there are certain examples where it, it's standing out like a sore thumb and others where we're not talking about it. So it can be done. Um, there, there is nuances just, to that, though. There are nuances mm. because you've got, a, you've got the club captain. You've got the, the, the club, but the team captain all last season. And yeah. he played the most of the games. He's in the team. I understand, like, an Elliot Anderson, who's not playing so many games, not a regular, going to go for first-team football. He's, he's actually happy to go, but or happier to go. But someone like Conor Gallagher, he wants to stay at Chelsea. Obviously, listen, the manager doesn't want him. That's fine. But... Is he getting a choice in this in terms of clubs? Is it he, uh, my my feeling? If I was him, he's now flying back from Madrid. He's there's pictures been posted in Madrid, like almost happy to be there with his wife, his girlfriend, and his his family, etc. And now he's having to come back with his towel between his legs. You can't tell me that there won't be a bitterness in him towards the hierarchy at Chelsea, and then that will filter onto his teammates who will be going, yeah, they're bang out of order. This is a disgrace. How can our, 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 t- our club be treating our players like this? Homegrown players. Chalabar, another one. You're not coming on tour. Stay at home. Get away. Stay there. You're being put right to one side. The kid's given his whole life to the club. Trained yeah, and it, sweat, blood and tears it, for years to come through. What example, what is this setting the tone for the next wave of academy players that are coming through? Yeah, it's not a good situation and it it doesn't really reflect well on the game and, as you say, the system. But it it also has echoes of Mason Mount a year ago. So we've been through this before and 
a question I'd ask for you is, is, you know, if he wanted to stay enough and there was appreciation on behalf of Chelsea, then they should have agreed a new contract. They should have found a compromise. The fact that they haven't suggests that one of the parties at least isn't happy. Does Conor Gallagher want to commit his future to the club? Was he unhappy with the contract offer? Was he eyeing free agency? Only he can say that. If Mm. Chelsea don't see him as part of their plans or they're not prepared for him to go into his last year or Maresca doesn't feel that he fits his style of play, then they're entitled to that opinion as well. And I guess a question I would ask you, Rio, despite what you explained about the background, and all players should be respected, no doubt. There have been some things in these last few months with PSR um, and, and the homegrown players that haven't sat well with me at all and many others. The way that they've had to uproot at short notice, deals have been struck between clubs To my information, certain of the players don't even know that this is happening. And they've had a choice. Do you want to stay? And the conditions might not be amazing. Or do you want to make the move? And ultimately, they probably have to make the move. But is Conor Gallagher good enough in your eyes? Do you think he's better than Caicedo and Lavia and Enzo Fernandez? And if the the Chelsea hierarchy and head coach don't think so, um, do you think they have a legitimate reason to want to trade him? Or not? There's there's no new contract there, you know. There's, yeah. and it takes no, two I get, to I get, I get I get that, Dave, and I I understand that. Where if the player isn't deemed good enough or the right player or the right fit, then yeah, definitely you got to then work out a way for him to go. But surely there's a way that this happens that isn't what we're seeing yeah. now, where he's being embarrassed, he's being left to hung hung out to dry. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's he's having to come back on a plane with his towel between his legs. Like what what that can't be right? Do you know what I mean? But ah. Uh, I look at him and think he's different to what they've got in there. That's one thing I would say. He might, he might, he might not be as as pleasing on the eye as some of the players that they have there, but he is different. He gives them a different element. And again, there's a lot to be said for somebody that lives and breathes a club that knows the fabric of the club that's come through as an academy player. Those players have to be respected, and you have to look at them like this is part of a DNA of our of our, of our club that we would like to keep. They spent a lot of money on that youth system over the years. They've been very successful in terms of winning stuff and they've been brought for a hell of a lot of players. But I look at it, let's even go to someone like Chalabar. You look at him, are they bringing better players than him? Like vast players that are, uh, there's a huge difference between him. You look at Tosin has come in, Desarsi, 39 million pounds. You look at Badia Shill, like are these players much better than than Chalaba? I wouldn't say so. I'll say it's a, it's a bit like this, but I wouldn't go, wow, he's supremely better. And I'm thinking, and you're going to treat him like this as well? So you look at it like that and you go, hmm, are they actually doing good business here at the moment? It doesn't well, seem to be. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. There's no doubt it's been a tumultuous period of change at Chelsea and from one ownership to the other and the issues that have come with the investigation into some of the dealings, uh, under the Abramovich era, you've then got this massive outlay on players. Some of it you could understand because players like Antonio Rudiger and Andreas Christensen were let go for free. There was a really high um, salary structure. They've tried to bring that down. You've seen these mammoth contracts to spread the length of mm. these uh, transfer fees and a much lower salary uh basis uh, structure on average now Uh, and that's something that new players are going to have to fit into and even you know when you see Cole Palmer rewarded with a new contract it sounds like it's still significantly below what the highest earners were on before Mm. Um, and you know they will make mistakes along the way no doubt and I think every club does and there will be some pieces of recruitment and decisions that have been made already by this new regime that they'd reflect on and think we didn't Uh, do that right you're seeing players where it doesn't work out who are already apparently up for uh, or available for transfer but then on the flip side you know we do need to be quite patient and and give this project time to mature because there will be players who prove to be really good signings Cole Palmer Mm. immediately one of the best players in the Premier League and and he's scoring for England in the Euros final Um, when I hear about the young player that Chelsea have signed from Brazil Esteval people there Mm. and who know that market talk about him as being an absolute generational talent like he's going to be a star not one person I've spoken to says anything different about a player like wow. that and 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 so they are signing gems for the future yet they've committed great expense on transfer fees now not on salaries it's got to be said as I explained they, they're trying to bring the wage bill down but look across that squad now and and if they are to add before the end of the window say a, a, a 
really good goal scorer, then you're in a position where I think they've got a, the basis of a very good, talented, competitive squad for now and definitely for the future. And then it's up to the manager, the head coach to gel them. Yeah, that's the, that's the that's the big point. I think that can the manager get that all knitted together? The talent's there. The nucleus of talent is there. We get that. And the, the potential is huge within that squad with what they've bought, but it's getting it all functioning together. Let's move on to my old club, Manchester mm-hmm. United. And, and mm-hmm. you obviously, you've got your ear to the ground on and you break a lot of these stories around transfers. What what are we seeing that's different um, about the way the club are approaching their transfer business this season compared to the last few years where it's been a bit kind of just like throw money at it and see if it, if it, if it works? Yeah, if we talk about change at Chelsea, it's been just as big, if not bigger, at Manchester United with Ratcliffe coming on as a minority um, owner, part owner of Manchester United, but also gaining sporting control, immediately setting about about making key appointments in in the major positions, uh, such as Omar Barada as chief executive, then in chronological order, Jason Wilcox um, arrived on, on the technical side. Barada, of course, had his gardening leave at Man City. He then started. They finally got a deal sorted for Dan Ashworth to come in as sporting director. They got Christopher Vivell, formerly of Chelsea and RB Leipzig, etc., in to help on, on the recruitment side. They already had people working on transfer negotiations and contracts like Matt Hargreaves. And so that was the first thing that they needed to do. How does it work within that organisation in terms of recruiting players and then the negotiations for players to get the transfers done? Is it, I don't know, is it is Jason Wilcox heading that up or is it Omar Brody or yeah, think- who is it? I, th- I think that structure is still settling down. It's relatively early days. And don't forget that people arrived into their positions at different times. So ultimately, you've got Ineos and, and Dave Brailsford as their sporting director kind of overseeing things. But Manchester United is being run by Omar Barada, chief executive on a daily basis. On the football side, you then have Dan Ashworth as the sporting director. He's kind of in charge of implementing what the powers that be decide for their vision, the the way forward for Manchester United. Um, On the football side, the interaction with the manager, watching training sessions, the pathway from academy to first team. uh, And initially, there was a lot of conversation with agents. I think that will change as things go forward. It was Hmm. Jason Wilcox, uh, because he was in the building first before any of the others, Dan Ashworth and Omar Barada. And then to help with the player identification and, and recruitment, is Christopher Vivell. That's initially a short-term deal, um, but it, it may be extended longer term. So I think at this point in time, you've got Jason Wilcox having a, a lot of conversations uh, initially, but maybe that will be more Dan Ashworth going forward as the sporting director. I'm sure Omar Barada can lend a hand to it because he's done this sort of thing at Manchester City. Um, for example, he worked on the Erling Haaland deal at Man City. That involved the agent Rafaela Pimenta. She is the agent also for Mateus Delict and Nusair Mazraoui. You could say, are there too many cooks? There's Matt Hargreaves in there who is heavily involved in the conversations, um, contract negotiations, talks, offers um, and proposals. So I think in time you will see that settle down. Have they got any more business to be done? You're saying you got, they're talking about the midfielder at PSG. Is that, is, can that get done or is it, are they, is their work done now? Yeah, so just back to your question on what was different. Well, they acted quickly in the market. Um, so mm. fair play to them in that sense. They they moved very rapidly to um, bring in Lenny Oro. And, and that was a massive piece of recruitment that I think in time, and, and we'll come on to talk about it, will be seen um, as a shrewd move. A player wanted by Real Madrid and Liverpool, seen as a generational talent, still a teenager and already... Uh, unfortunately injured and and having to undergo surgery on a metatarsal break. Um, But I think that will be a a sensational acquisition. Midfield is definitely a priority. Yes, the interest is well documented in Ugarte, but Manchester United, as I recently reported, um, don't intend to pay the figure that at the moment Paris Saint-Germain want for him, which is around the 60 million euros that they paid for him just 12 months ago. Massively. If that figure comes down, then yeah, it's something that can be looked at. Or or do you talk about other situations with other players? There are reports of maybe could Jadon Sancho go to PSG as part of the Ugarte deal? I don't have information on that at the minute. He's a target, but there are other players that Manchester United mm. are considering. And there's no guarantee that that one will get done. They're studying other possibilities, but that is an important position for them. And then they'll see as the window draws to a close, who can they get out? Who can they raise money for? What money can come into the club? And then do you look to 
bolster the front line further with an opportunistic recruit. Loads of names have been linked with with Manchester United. I don't know of anything concrete on that front. And uh, sorry, I should have thrown this over to you because I mentioned Lenny Yoro in that. Um, and it was quite well documented that you played a bit of a role in um, <laughs> convincing yeah, yeah. him to come to Manchester United. Can you tell us any more? Um, yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I know Jason Wilcox. We played with each other at, um, at Leeds yeah. United all them years ago. Um, and obviously, he went to City as Academy Manager, and we we've ended up staying in contact. But obviously, Lenny Ura being a centre-back, a young kid, I made a similar type of move as a young player. Um and had that experience and listen they all know I love I love watching and chatting to the young players and and just kind of seeing where they are what they're like as young human beings as well and if any any of the young players want or need any advice I'm always there open they can get through to me through through different different channels so with that in mind I mean as I said I I just reached out to Lenny just to see listen if he ever needed to speak to anybody about this to make the right decision. Yes, Real Madrid wanted him. Yes, Liverpool wanted him. But my, I want him to come to Man United. I, I, I watched this kid a few times now. I've seen a lot of highlights of him as well. And I just feel he's, at his age is the best in the world at that age. There ain't no one, I don't think, near him at that age. With the experience that he's got as well at that age, no one comes close. And I think his ceiling is super high. Um but you need to make the right decisions. And I think that I, I made those steps. I think, that, listen, I, I have to be honest, I, I, I said to him as well, if you, your dream is an, that one day you want to you play for Real Madrid, you'd love to play for Man United, from what he was saying to me, love both clubs. And I said, listen, why, you could do both. But I think the best step for you right now is Manchester United. Listen, he may go to Real Madrid in five, six, seven years, but he also... So he may be a catalyst and part of the reason why Man United turn it around and stay there for 10, 12 years. That's my hope. But I think, as I said, I think for his step as, a, as an individual, take my Man United hat off. I think as an individual, this is the perfect step for him to come to Man United at this stage of his career. When you were on the call, did you get a sense that you were convincing him that he was swaying in that direction or were you not sure at that point? Yeah, I, I just thought listening to him speak, he sounded so mature. And so sure of himself, confident without being arrogant or ignorant at all. Um, and he asked some good questions about about playing in game time. And and when I was telling him these types of things, it wasn't it, there wasn't really any rebuttal at all. It was just one in deep listening type thing. And yeah, I, I weren't too sure where he was going to go. I was quite I was confident that he'd heard me. I think that's the most important thing. Where you go on a call sometimes with people and you think, right, listen, I don't know if I, if I, if I actually got beneath the surface I thought I'd actually I, I pricked his ears a little bit of a couple of the things especially around game time and development and the, a club really wanting to push you on and build around you and I think that's where Man United are at the moment with these young players you look at the likes of Kobe, Kobe Maynard and, and Ganacho the, the club are wanting to build around these types of young players and he, he'll fall into that category easily When you were playing did former players get involved in your transfers or did you hear about former players getting involved in other transfers in a way that you've done here to just try and educate and persuade to mm. help it happen? No, I, I didn't have that personally. Um, my deal just kind of happened. But I think every deal is individual and I think it, I'm sure it would have gone on. I don't remember it with any other players. I've not heard anything like that. But I just look at things with, and that's how I always feel. I'm always been enthusiastic about young players coming through and seeing who's the next talents coming through. It excites me. But also, I look back when I was a player. Would would I've appreciated a little call from somebody who might have played my position or who's walked the walk that I'm about to to go on? Yeah, I would have. And so that's that's that, that's why I, I enjoy it, and I'm always open to doing that type of thing. But um, listen, great to speak to you, man. Obviously, love having you on. This is going to be a regular thing seeing you on the channel, man, because you are the guy. I'm looking at your feed every morning I wake up. That's what I do. So I'll continue to do that, man. So pleasure to have you on. And thanks a lot, Dave. No, it's my pleasure. Anytime, Rio.